It was an interesting time to sort of think about how can we illustrate the gains around having this equality and what does it really mean in concrete terms. Um, and one thing that we did was that we had uh, in, uh, in Sweden we had a uh, an exhibition, a photo exhibition that was created by a Swedish photographer about fatherhood. Uh, so in Sweden we have uh, 14 months of parental leave. We share that equally between the man and the woman. Uh, if the man doesn't take uh, at least three months, you lose them. Uh, this has, of course, raised a lot of eyebrows in the beginning. So how can you force the father to be at home with the kids? You know, you, that's not fair and, you know, everyone should choose themselves. And we said, fine. You can choose yourself, you don't have to take it, you just don't get it. Uh, but what it has created, of course, is the fact that now in every workplace, there is no questions asked. Uh, which in the beginning, you know, the father would say, oh, I would love to be home with the kids, but you know, it doesn't work. You know, my boss would never agree. My, you know, my friends at the office would laugh at me. It's like, oh, you're going to be home with the kids. Um, but that doesn't happen anymore because it's like, well, I don't have a choice, you know, because if I don't take those months, I, we will not have them. So it has sort of, in that sense, it has grown into being totally accepted. And I would say in Sweden now, if you are a father and you don't take your parental leave, people would think you're insane. Uh, so it's, it has changed. It has taken a few years, but it has changed. Mm -hmm. So we take this concept to Mozambique where they have one day of parental leave if you're a father. So if you have a child and you're a father, you get one day. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty big contrast, one could say. So we take the photo exhibition and we take it around to the most, you know, like s towns up north in Mozambique. Not a lot of things happening there. Uh, and we have the exhibition uh, and, you know, you show it like a Swedish father with a kid on the back and vacuum cleaner, you know, stuff like that that is just completely unheard of in, uh, in the rural of Mozambique. Uh, and we have discussions around what does fatherhood mean to you? And what was really incredible with this experience, I thought, was that there were so many young, uh, young men, boys, many of them, I don't think they were fathers yet, who knows, uh, and they were so engaged in this question. You know, we had wonderful discussions and they were like, how do you do that? And, you know, I really would like to be home, but, you know, my wife's mother, she forces me to go out and work and I'm not allowed to, you know, feed my child. It was like all of these different discussions. That was, it was really incredible. And, and I think that was something that also really taught me that sometimes we think that we, I mean, we do live with some sort of prejudice around how people think and how cultures are. But, you know, in general, people are still people. So these cultures, they're not, we're not that different, uh, you know, in the end. Um, so I thought for me that was a, one of the interesting experiences. Then, of course, there was a lot of discussions in Mozambique about um, very early, uh, I would say, forced partnerships. So I don't like to call, call it child marriage because marriage to me is supposed to be something you do voluntarily and love and something a little bit beautiful. But you know, if you're 12 and you get married off with, uh, with a man of 50, yeah. I don't think there's a whole lot of you know, love <laughs> going on. Anyway, so but this forced partnership is very common in Mozambique. Very, uh, I think one of the, yeah, I think they are like top five of, of child forced partnerships in, in the world. Uh, and of course, this is very much linked to you know the economic situation, and you, you think that you're gonna, you can't. Afford, this is the best thing you can do for your daughter. Uh, whilst we, of course, uh, believe that it would be better to give your daughter education so that she can manage on her own and all of these things. So it's, it's an uphill. Um, but this was something that we engaged uh, a lot in. I'm happy to talk more about that. But it's also links to one of these R's about the rights and the right, of course, also to your own body and your own sexuality and you know, reproductive rights and how many kids do you want and who should decide that for you and things like that. Uh, but anyway, I, I will fast forward a bit uh, so that we have time also to maybe uh, discuss also and just fast forward a bit then to New York. So here, Sweden is since one year back a uh, member of the Security Council. And this obviously dominates quite a lot, uh, the work that we do at the mission right now, apart from the fact that we are also one of the largest donors to the UN uh, development system and the humanitarian system. So that also occupies quite a lot of our time. And it's quite an interesting combination because we all know these days that you know, all of these things fit together, right? So you don't have development there, and politics there, and security there, you know, because it all, you know, it all goes together. Uh, then you can name and frame and package it in different ways. But I think we all know it's all politics in the end and it all links to development and, and all of that. Uh, but what, what I've experienced, if I would just take a few snapshots from my last week, 
um, is that of course now we've been in the council almost a year, so you get a lot of questions. So, oh, what's your experience? How has it been? And what have you focused on? And things like that. And then a lot of the focus we have had. Uh, is, of course, since we have a feminist foreign policy, uh, about women, peace and security. And it's not only about, you know, putting that word into a resolution uh, in the Security Council and then you've done it, uh, but when you have done that um, consistently for a while, what happens is that when you come back to that agenda item on the Council uh, and you get the reporting back from the field, from a peacekeeping mission or whatever, then those questions that we have asked will have to be answered. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this is you can actually form the system in that way. You can force uh, the system to deliver information about how are women included in these negotiations and why is that important. Well, for obvious many reasons, but one thing that uh, I think is worth thinking of is that we have had uh, peacekeeping going on for quite some time. And we, have, we know that most conflicts, uh, you have a solution and you go back into conflict, right? Uh, and could it be possible that if we include women in peace negotiations and in peace processes, maybe it becomes more sustainable? which actually in the few cases where you have included women, it has proven to be more sustainable. So um, I, yet again, there is this issue of whether you are you know, a feminist or not, or whether you believe in this or not, the fact is why not give it a try? Because it obviously hasn't worked until now, so let's be open and try something new and see if that might work. So that has been a little bit of our uh, sort of pitch uh, in the council and, uh, and um, you know, we're yet again, if you're persistent, it might, it might actually, uh, uh, be a difference in the end. And we do feel that there is sort of a, a growing acceptance uh, of this fact that you know, women has a, an obvious role around the table when you discuss the future of your country. Um, I just wanted to finish off also with this uh, one thing that we, we see very often is that uh, when you discuss issues of peace and security <coughs> or you discuss you know, preventing violent extremism or you talk about terrorism, uh, or you talk about development, you know, all of these issues is very often you sort of frame women as victims. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, I think, something that is, is a very important part in, in my foreign ministers and in sort of in our policies is to really try to be a little bit uh, more realistic about how the world looks like. You know, women are not victims. We are also victims sometimes, as men are. Um, but there is, women are most and foremost actors. Mm. Uh, so I would like to leave you with that and what actors could mean. Uh, it can mean a lot of different things in different settings, of course. But I think that is, uh, uh, is I think, an important thing to always bear in mind. <laughs>